Five murders that diary entries help solve. A diary is considered something sacred, and they offer an intimate glimpse into a person's life. The joys and the sorrows experienced, the problems dealt with, the victories savored, and even the heinous crimes committed. Diaries bear witness to them all. Here are five murders that diary entries help solve. Number five, Trisha Todd. Trisha Todd, a mother of one, was last seen alive on April 26, 2016. The 33-year-old was married to fellow Air Force Service personnel Stephen Williams. After 11 years of marriage, the couple decided to get a divorce, and the woman left the service and moved with Faith, their two-year-old daughter, to be near her family in Hobe Sound, Florida. Less than three months after the breakup, Trisha then vanished without a trace. Left without a clue, her family sought the local sheriff's department's help. They immediately launched an investigation, and along with their search, found security footage showing Trisha shopping at a local grocery store and then going back home after. They also traced her cell phone records and discovered that she had gone to see her ex. The man had traveled to Hobe South from North Carolina to spend the week with Faith. When asked, the airman told the cops that Trisha was supposed to pick up the baby the next day, but she never did. So he left the child with a babysitter and flew back to the base. Detectives couldn't say for sure if Stephen had something to do with Trisha's disappearance. His alibis all seemed to check out. And what's more, the man volunteered to take a lie detector test, which he passed. As the investigation went on, new leads were found though, this time from a rather curious source, a diary. In her journal, Trisha uncovered some of the most horrible truths about Stephen. In a 2009 entry, she had a picture of her dogs with a message that revealed that her then husband had killed the pets. The reason simply being that he was annoyed with all the barking. And the cats weren't spared either. Another pose showed her with a cat that had died after its neck was broken. Two other cats also suffered the same cruelty. In a more recent journal entry, Trisha showed a photo of their small dog, Peanut. She said that the pet was beaten to death with a crutch, and she described how the man just stood by and watched coldly while she cried and cleaned up the blood. Having read the entries, the Martin County Police Detectives now had reason to suspect that the airman had something to do with the woman's disappearance. He was once again interrogated, after he was presented with more incriminating evidence linking him to the case, the suspect finally gave in. On May 24, 2016, Stephen confessed to killing Trisha. With a plea deal of 35 years, the accused agreed to take authorities to the Hungryland Wildlife and Environmental Area in Martin County, where he showed them where he dumped Trisha's remains. The prosecution instantly regretted offering him the 35 years, which practically saved him from a death sentence. Number 4. Martha Moxley The Martha Moxley case is always thought to be one of the most perplexing murder cases in American history. And had it not been for the victim's diary entries, the mystery behind her death would have remained unsolved. On October 30, 1975, the body of Martha Moxley was found in the backyard of her home in Greenwich, Connecticut. The 15-year-old was viciously attacked by a perpetrator who bludgeoned her head with a golf club. The assailant then shoved the broken shaft down through her neck. She was found with her pants off, but the medical examiner confirmed she had not been sexually assaulted. The girl was last seen alive on the lawn of Thomas and Michael Skakel's home. The brothers, who were Martha's friends and neighbors, happened to be nephews of Ethel Skakel Kennedy, the widow of Robert F. Kennedy. Interestingly, 
The golf club used in the crime belonged to the collection of the Skakel family. Michael, who was also 15 at the time of the murder, was considered a suspect. However, he got off the hook when he passed a lie detector test. So with no new leads, authorities were forced to set the case aside. Then in 1998, the state of Connecticut reignited a new investigation, which now linked Michael to the case. In 2002, he was found guilty of slaying the teenager and got 20 years to life. A decade later, though, a Connecticut judge overruled the decision and had him released on a $1.2 million bail. In 2016, the Connecticut Supreme Court reinstated the conviction, but vacated it later on. Two years after, a new trial was ordered, but the same high court said in 2020 that it would not retry Michael, who was by then 60 years old. It was a strange case, and in 2000, despite the objections of the defendant's camp, Martha's diary entries were officially entered into evidence by the prosecution. In them, she confided her thoughts and feelings on things that mattered to any high school girl of her age. Her entries in September of 75 in particular disclosed much about her opinion of the defendant and his older brother Thomas. Apparently both Skakels had a thing for the blonde, but Martha didn't share their sentiments. In the text, it seemed like she felt adverse towards them. She described Tom as flirty and touchy, while she called Michael names in her diary. One prosecutor argued that the victim's contempt towards the younger Skakel amounted to motive. In other words, the male teenager was unable to handle the rejection, pushing him to commit the brutal crime that ended Martha's life. Despite the public's outcry, though, Michael Skakel remains free to this day. Number three, Honora Parker. Sweet and perfect, yet creepy and bizarre at the same time. This is how the friendship between Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume can be described. Overly dependent on each other, the two were inseparable and couldn't live without one another. No one ever tried to break up their relationship. The last time it happened, it ended with a cold-blooded murder. The victim was Honora Reaper, whose legal name was Honora Parker. She was killed by her own 16-year-old daughter, Pauline, and 15-year-old Juliet. On June 22, 1954, the two friends led Honora to a secluded place in Victoria Park in Christchurch, New Zealand, where she was bludgeoned to death with a brick wrapped in an old stocking. They pretended to ask for help, but the circumstances made it apparent that Mrs. Parker didn't die from a fall, as the girls had initially claimed. On that same day, the teenagers were arrested for murder, and two months later, their trial began. One of the highlights in the hearing were Pauline's sensational diary entries. The journal, which she called the Handy Diary for 1954, contained incredible details of her life, her friendship with Juliet, the fantasy world they both imagined and lived in, the religion they conceptualized, and a great deal of literature pieces they wrote together. But the most unnerving of them all were the entries she made days before the murder. In these personal logs, she revealed that they needed to eradicate the obstacles that hindered them from staying together. Those who witnessed the readings of the entries were taken aback when they found out through the text that the girls were actually excited and looking forward to what they referred to as moiter, a.k.a. murder. Defense lawyers argued that the details in the girls' diary entries point to the author's insanity. The prosecution, however, said that the entries rather showed how the girls deliberately planned the killing In fact, in one entry, Pauline wrote that they had discussed the murder. She said, We discussed the moiter fully. I feel very keyed up, as if I was planning a surprise party. 
So the next time I write in the diary, mother will be dead. How odd, yet how pleasing. On August 28, 1954, the girls were found guilty of murdering Honora Parker. But since they were both too young to be considered for the death penalty, each received five years in jail instead. Both got out in 1960. After her release, Juliet rejoined her family and later changed her name to Anne Perry, the famous historical detective novelist. Pauline, on the other hand, was given a new identity as Hilary Nathan. Number two, Peter Farquhar. Peter Farquhar was an English novelist and a university lecturer. He was found dead in his home in the village of Maids Moreton, Buckinghamshire, on October 26, 2015. His death was initially ruled to be accidental, the result of acute alcohol intoxication. The incident was written out as just another unfortunate circumstance until his neighbor, Ann Martin, a retired head teacher, died in a similar way a year and a half later. This prompted the police to launch a murder investigation. They exhumed Peter's body, and the medical examiner found out that instead of an accidental overdose, the 69-year-old was actually poisoned over a long period of time. Investigators found his drinks had been spiked with bioethanol and poteen, a very strong Irish alcohol. His food was laced with drugs as well. In his journals, Detectives found out how the Christian man had struggled with homosexuality over the years. Much later on in them, he then revealed that he had finally met the love of his life. Ben can love me, a miracle if ever there was one, Peter wrote in a 2013 entry. Investigators immediately traced the man mentioned in the diary, who they found out to also be a close acquaintance of the 81-year-old deceased woman a university graduate, a training vicar, and a church warden. The man in question, Ben Field, had come into the lives of both individuals pretending to be their monogamous lover. What Ben did to Peter and Anne were months of gaslighting, a form of psychological manipulation designed to make a person question their sanity. As a result, it would be easy to take control of them, with Anne, he would confuse her senses by writing messages on her mirrors and making it appear to be from God. Anne, a very religious woman, easily fell to the scheme. In his later confessions, 24-year-old Ben admitted to the police that he had planned to kill his target slowly while making it look like an accident. The reason behind this elaborate scheme was simple. It was to get them to change their wills. Described by the court as a cunning and scheming psychopath, Ben Field was sentenced in October of 2019 to a minimum of 36 years in prison for the death of Peter Farquhar. Oddly enough, he wasn't found guilty for Ann Martin's death. Number 1. Harvey Family Murders On the night of September 3, 2018, Anthony Harvey attacked his wife of three years, Mara, when she arrived home from work. He then stabbed his daughters, three-year-old Charlotte, and two-year-old twins, Beatrix and Alice, who were all sleeping peacefully in their beds. The day after, Mara's mother, Beverly Quinn, arrived at the victim's house and was also killed. While these actions are obviously terrifying in themselves, what makes it worse is that the killer dad from Bedford, Perth, Australia, wrote the harrowing details of the crimes before committing them. In his journal entries, he laid out his plan on how to carry out the murders. Tonight, I will kill my wife, bludgeon her to death, then smother my children, and in the morning, murder my mother-in-law. Like a household chore, he went on to make a to-do list. Call Mara's work, fake injury, call Andrew, give away all jobs. Call girls' school, deaf interstate, he specified. Apparently, the thought of ending the lives of his family didn't come easy for him. 
In another entry, he seemed to contemplate his options before choosing the heinous deed. Leaving unannounced slash seeking a divorce equals least heat. Making entire family disappear equals no money. Eliminating family and embezzle funds equals prep, he wrote. In later investigations, it was found that Anthony, who owned a land mowing service company, had lived with the bodies of the deceased for five days. After that period of time, on September 9, 2018, he turned himself into authorities. He was arrested immediately. And the next day, the suspect was charged with five counts of murder. Less than a year later, the father of three pleaded guilty to the charges. During his trial, his notes were read and it was found out that he actually even wrote apology letters to the victims. I'm so sorry, I think I've lost my mind. He wrote in a letter found on Mara's body. Take care of those little girls like you always do, he went on to say. Beverly, I'm so, so, so very sorry. You all deserved so much better. And while he said in his succeeding letters that there was really no reason for him to commit such an act, Testimonies revealed that the accused had long been expressing his indifference towards his own daughters. A party-goer, a drunkard, and a drug user, Anthony would often show his disdain towards his responsibility of being a father. In July of 2019, the Supreme Court of Western Australia sentenced him to life in prison with no chance of parole. He would be the first person in the state to ever receive that punishment. So there were five murders that diary entries helped solve. People are protective over their diaries and journals because on their pages are written their well-kept secrets. They are locked, sealed, and hidden for the reason that if they happen to come out, they will definitely send chills running up and down their readers' spines. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe and hit the notification bell. We have new videos coming out every single week for you guys to check out. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.